So um, hello and welcome again to um, researching Queer London with Senate House Libraries Resources. This is the second in a planned series of researching London sessions, each focusing on specific themes. My name is Argola Rublak, the academic librarian for history at Senate House Library, and I will be one of the presenters talking to you today. So, and our aim for the session today is to provide some ideas for researching queer London literature and history, and to suggest some of Senate House Library's holdings that will help you during the study of this topic as well. The main part of the session will last for roughly 45 minutes, and there will be time at the end of the hour for your questions as well. We will also circulate a list of resources after the session, as well as the recording of this session. And the list of resources will contain works referenced during the session and a few further suggestions for resources to help you further with your topic of research. And the session is arranged into three different short presentations. First of all, we will have Dr. Sarah Pike speaking, who is currently the Tide Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the Institute of English Studies. And she is developing a toolkit for diversity and inclusion in English studies during this process, or called TIDE for short. She will also be presenting on her research into queer Bloomsbury during this session. And after Sarah's presentation, Dr. Richard Espley, the head of modern collections at Senate House Library, will introduce you to some of Senate House Library's archival holdings for researching LGBTQ London history, <laughs> focusing in particular on the collections of Eric Dingwall and of Alec Craig that we hold in the library. Lastly, my colleague Leila Kassir, the academic librarian for British, US, Latin American and Caribbean literature, and I will introduce you to two e-resources that you can access through Senate House Library to support your research into LGBTQ plus London history and literature. So now we will first hand over to Sarah to start us off. Thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone and thanks for coming along to today's session. My name is Sarah Pike. I'm postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute of English Studies, which is part of the School of Advanced I work at one of the institutes that shares Senate House building with Senate House Library. And although we're all joining remotely today, this is quite a situated talk. So um, just imagine we're all together in the library space and that you can wander out of the library and into the surrounding streets afterwards. Whatever your motivations or intentions for researching queer London, its literatures, histories or its spaces, sorry about this, computer issues, um, whether they're lost and forgotten, memorialised, recovered or contemporary, the library is obviously an appropriate place to begin. In fact, libraries are very often the starting point for explorations of queer identities, particularly for previous generations, seeking knowledge, information and understanding in the face of historic queer invisibility and cultural silence surrounding same sex desire or non normative gender identity. As I explored in my own doctoral research, which examined LGBTQ adults' memories of reading in childhood and adolescence, libraries are places which can hold rich, queer, effective or emotional histories alongside the books on the shelves. And here are just two quotations for you. So the first one here um, by a woman called Sandy Kern, on first hearing the word lesbian as a teenager in 1946. She says, I ran to the library and looked up the word lesbian and I felt so proud of myself. And here's another one from Nancy Garden, who you may know as the author of proto YA uh, novel, uh, Annie on my mind, kind of lesbian coming of age and love story. This is with an interview um with her she says even looking at books was scary let alone buying them or taking them out of the library what if someone saw so in some cases libraries can be and historically have been repositories of anxiety shame or fear but more often we hope they can also call into being experiences of recognition 
comfort and belonging and you may have had similar experiences of your own either in the library or maybe on the um, if you're interested in how experiences with books and reading have shaped queer subjectivities, one really useful treatment of this topic is Richard Hawkins' book, The Spirit and the Architect, which you'll find referenced in the resource list and bibliography um, that we'll share after the session. And as we go, I draw your attention to various books and other resources, um, but all of the details will be in that document that will be made available to you. And I should say, of course, that libraries hold more than books, too. They also hold oral history collections, for example. And you can hear people talking about their experiences of queer London, including experiences with books, reading and libraries in the Hall Carpenter Oral History Project Archive at the British Library, which is the UK's largest collection of gay and lesbian life stories. Can we move to the next slide, please? Now, you may be aware that Senate House Library has recently become home to a significant collection of LGBTQ materials, some 30,000 works, in fact, which date from 1760 to the 2010s. And this is the Cut Bill Collection, the personal library of a pioneer, pioneering LGBT activist named Jonathan Cutbill, who died the year before last in May 2019. He began collecting queer literature in earnest in the 1970s while working in museums, first in Cambridge and later in London. And with Ernest Hole and Peter Dory, he went on to found Bloomsbury's Gaze the Word Bookshop, which many of you may know, uh, the UK's first and for many years only lesbian and gay bookshop. And Jonathan Cutville stocked the secondhand and antiquarian selection, section sorry, of the bookshop, um, which is still going strong today. So this is Jonathan with his library and this photo um, is by Robert Workman and was taken on the opening day of Gaze the Word, which was nearly 42 years exactly on 24th of January 1979. So that's 42 years ago yesterday and you can see Jonathan Cutbill um, on the right hand side of that photo. These images are held by the Bishopsgate Institute. Um, during the 1980s, Cutbill continued to acquire not only rare books, but contemporary literature, physique magazines, pamphlets, and a complete run of gay news. For over 20 years, he bought a copy of every LGBT book, book that the bookshop stocked. Uh, the current manager of Gays the Word, Jim McSweeney, told the bookseller in 2019. So that gives you some sense of what a rich collection this is. And I love this idea of a kind of parallel collection uh, being built up next to the collection of a bookshop. But this is one that obviously accretes and grows rather than being depleted because people aren't buying things from it. Um, Jonathan Cutbill also founded a support group called Gay Icebreakers, which met at the shop. And he was key in gaining public acceptance of Wilfred Owen as a gay poet. He wrote an essay in New Statesman in 1987 called The Truth Untold, which made the case for Owen's homosexuality based on Cutbill's own interpretation of his poems. And for more information on Jonathan Cutbill, there's a really useful blog by the director of Cambridge University's Cedric Museum, Liz Hyde. So I want to introduce this new and exciting collection to you. And it's so new, in fact, that it's still uncatalogued. And to suggest why Senate House Library is such a fitting home for it, and at the same time, to locate Senate House Library as an institution within queer Bloomsbury. Um, so if we could move to the next slide, please. Bloomsbury can be thought of as a kind of transitional queer space located between London's west and east ends and uh, Roger Luckhurst is one critic that's written of Bloomsbury as a kind of liminal space. Um, but the most obvious association with Bloomsbury of course is the Bloomsbury group or Bloomsbury set. Um, so you might think of Virginia Woolf who had a relationship with Vita Sackville West for whom she wrote Orlando, uh, Duncan Grant who had relationships with men and women including Vanessa Bell, Virginia Woolf's sister, and their daughter Angelica, who grew up to marry David Bunny Garnet, who had been Grant's lover. Or you might think of Lytton Strachey, Dora Carrington and Ralph Partridge, who lived together in a 
kind of triangular relationship. You probably know Dorothy Parker's famous remark that the Bloomsbury set lived in squares, painted in circles and loved in triangles. So here is a plaque at 51 Gordon Square uh, on this slide and there's another plaque to the Bloomsbury group in uh, Brunswick Square as well. You might like to investigate the collection Queer Bloomsbury, edited by Madeleine Detloff and Brenda Helt. And there's also a new collection of letters between Virginia Woolf and Vita Sackville West, uh, published by Vintage and introduced by lesbian graphic novelist and cartoonist Alison Bechdel, which comes out very early next month. I think it comes out next week, in fact. Um, but Bloomsbury holds other queer histories too. Uh, Victorian crossdressers Fanny and Stella lodged in Wakefield Street. There's a plaque to them at number 13. There's a tree planted for filmmaker, artist and writer Derek Jarman in the Marchmont Community Garden beside the Brunswick Centre, um, near Scoob Books and round the back of Waitrose, if you know where that is. And another blue plaque, this time for actor and diarist Kenneth Williams in Marchmont Street, commemorating his childhood home above a shop. And just to end with a fictional example here, anyone who read and enjoyed Noel Stratfield's 1936 novel Ballet Shoes as a child might recall the clearly queer coded uh, women academics, Dr. Smith and Dr. Jakes, here on the right hand side. Um, one with a necktie, short hair and sensible shoes, the other more conventionally feminine, who share a room and a life in that novel and who move together at the end of the book to a very charming flat in Bloomsbury. So if one way to research or map queer London is through its literary or book cultures, then the Cutbill Collection provides some fascinating insights into queer publishing in the 20th century. As Dr Justin Bengry highlighted in his recent Charles Holden Memorial Lecture for the Friends of Senate House Library in October 2020, Justin talked through some landmark queer publications contained in the collection and the controversies surrounding their publication including Rose Alatini's Despised and Rejected. Um, this novel was described on publication as a literary fungus by journalist James Douglas for its pacifist themes and accepting portrayal of homosexuality. And it was actually uh, prosecuted on publication in 1918 under the Defence of the Realm Act. Um, it was republished, however, in 2018 with an afterword by Jonathan Cattell in a Persephone Books edition. You can read a short recap of Justin Bengry's lecture um, in a blog on the Senate House Library website, Profit, Prosecution and Queer Publishing, and you can also watch a recording of the Holden Lecture on YouTube. Um, next slide, please. But Jonathan Cutbill himself was also implicated in a largely forgotten and certainly understudied episode in queer book culture. And this is the 1984 raids on Gays the Word by Her Majesty's Customs and Excise, known as Operation Tiger. They actually started in 1984 and continued throughout 85 and into 86. And officers seized thousands of pounds worth of books from Gays the Word bookshop around a third of the shop stock and Jonathan Cutbill was one of the nine directors and employees who faced imprisonment. They were accused under the Customs Consolidation Act 1876 of importing and selling indecent or obscene literature but the books that they seized um, were not indecent or obscene at all. Uh, Christine de Pizan, Jean Genet, Gina Barnes, Tennessee Williams, even Jean-Paul Sartre were some of the authors that the state suddenly deemed unsuitable for a book buying public. The customs officers responsible were ignorant of books, UK publishing and gays, Cutbill later wrote. The issue was really political. And after a long hard fought campaign urged on by Cutbill, the charges were eventually dropped. Um, because these charges were to do with importing books, rather than books published within the UK. Several of the works in question were held by libraries, including Senate House Library, and were freely available to all. There's a podcast on this really fascinating episode of queer book culture in the Logbook series by LGBT Switchboard, which just came out last week. And you can also watch on YouTube 
the recording of the brilliant event that took place at Senate House Library in 2018 as part of the Queer Between the Covers season with Jim McSweeney, who's the manager of Gaze the Word Bookshop, and Graham McCarrow, who is one of the campaign coordinators who worked to save the shop. It seems fitting then that the Cut Bill collection, a multi-layered queer archive, should be preserved in perpetuity at Senate House Library. The collection reaches beyond the bounds of the library building to its previous relation to that parallel or companion collection of queer books, The Stock of Gays the Word, in nearby Marchmont Street. And in the works that it holds, it gestures outwards to the surrounding streets of Bloomsbury and beyond. The Cut Bill collection will be made fully available in the months and years to come. But for now, if you'd like further information about the collection, uh, please contact Richard Espley, who will be speaking next in this session. Um, that's about it from me. I hope that was a helpful introduction. Uh, please do feel free to contact me um, either in the chat or personally with any questions or for any more information about anything that I have so briefly mentioned today. Um, my contact details will be shared at the end of this session. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And we thank you very much, Sarah. That's wonderful. And we're now going to move on to Dr. Richard Espley, who's going to talk about some of the collections within Senate House Library. Hi. Yes. Hello. Marvellous. That's Alec Craig. Um, fantastic uh, to hear about uh, Cut Bill. Um, and I cannot let the opportunity pass uh, when we have so many uh, interested persons on the, on the line, as it were, just to say that you may receive in the coming months uh, a, a request for uh, support for a campaign to catalogue uh, the Cut Bill collection because it is so vast and it, it's so impressive and it's so multifaceted um, that uh, it is a task that will take us decades uh, with our own resources and I cannot speak uh, highly enough of its power or how excited all of us are uh, to have it uh, to have it in the collection. Um, so I'm going to talk about some archival uh, holdings um, within the library. Um, that's not to say uh, that uh, our archival holdings on LGBTQ matters are kind of nationally preeminent. They're not, but what we have is really, really fascinating and it highlights uh, some big problems uh, and some uh, interesting factors about how LGBTQ material has been collected, has been preserved and hasn't been preserved um, over uh, particularly the 20th century. Um, so um, there's Alec Craig um, is perhaps uh, the most powerful example here. Um, now, Alec Craig is pictured there um, in his First World War uniform. Uh, Craig was um, a civil servant, um, but he was uh, mentally and physically deeply scarred uh, by his experience on the Somme. Uh, Craig was still having uh, surgery to correct uh, injuries he suffered in the trenches in the 1960s um, and he always described himself first and foremost as a soldier uh, which is why I have uh, chosen to illustrate him here um, in this picture. Um, Craig is principally known um, as a campaigner against uh, literary censorship, as a campaigner against um, the apparatus of um, accusations of obscenity, judgments of obscenity, which have uh, one of their last gasps, one would hope, uh, the fate willing uh, in Operation Tiger, although um, I do not think any of us can uh, afford to be entirely complacent about the dangers of these things returning. Um, one of the interesting things I would highlight here um, before I talk about what's in Craig's archive um, is that Craig had an almost total faith in the ability for legislative reform, for procedural reform. He believed that we could overcome all problems um, by dismantling the state apparatus um, uh, and judicial um, apparatus, uh, which is perhaps not true, perhaps he was a little overly um, optimistic. Um, the image on the right there is Craig's first published work uh, called Sex and Revolution. It came out in 1934 
Um, the publisher regretted publishing it. Um, they sold uh, less than a tenth of the print run. And at the end of Craig's life in the 1970s, he was still arguing with them about whether they should pulp uh, the reserved copies. Um, but it is an extraordinary work to come from nowhere, from a man who had never been published before and who had grown up in deep poverty and only uh, managed to get into the civil service because of his uh, army service in the First World War. Um, in Sex and Revolution, Craig uh, sets out a stall that campaigns for reform of almost every conceivable issue, uh, from the width of gates in public parks to make sure that mothers can get through them with prams, um, to uh, censorship legislation and absolutely uh, divorce reform and LGBT rights, um, to the extent that he understands them. For Craig, the ultimate aim was to reach, and these are quotes from this book, uh, to reach a point where society would allow all individuals to rejoice in sexual fulfillment, to reach a point where they could become most proud of their own sexual fulfillment as the chief achievement of their life. Um, and he regarded all sexual pleasure that was reciprocal and which can be brought about without serious and lasting injury. I do love those adjectives there uh, sh should be permitted by the law. Um, and he stated that the only tolerable uh, limits on sexual fulfillment should be wonderfully physical practicability and space. Um, now, uh, if I could have the next slide. Um, Craig was a member of a formidable number of campaigning organisations, um, including the Progressive League, which grew out of the um, Federation of Progressive Societies and Individuals founded by HG Wells. Um, rather like Craig, that organisation campaigned for everything from the establishment of national parks and the abolition of animals and circuses uh, to the end of all discrimination against, as they would have termed it, homosexuals. Um, the material which um, has survived in Craig's archive, one of the real reasons I want to highlight this is because it survived by the merest whisker of luck. Uh, when Craig died in 1973, there were around 20,000 books in his flat, small flat in Hampstead, um, and there was a formidable archive of all his unpublished writing and his correspondence. Um, his wife, who his own daughter has described to me as having been in open warfare with her husband for at least 20 years, um, on the day of his death, contacted a public library down the road and instructed them that anything that wasn't collected within 48 hours would be placed in a skip and disposed of. Um, what has come to Senate House is less than a thousand books and some boxes of archives which arrived seemingly by mistake and without permission from Senate House Library in 1973. And yet they are extremely rich. They include correspondence with Allen Ginsberg, inviting Ginsberg to give a reading in, in Craig's own flat, um, which I am still not sure whether that really took place, but it could possibly have been Ginsberg's first public reading in the United Kingdom. Um, but the fact that these papers survived is by sheer chance, and you can see the condition of the image of the piece of paper from the Progressive League there. It is not in good condition. They were not intended to survive. Um, and I think that tells us something about the chances of LGBTQ stories surviving in academic institutions. Um, Craig had all of his life sought a secure home for his holdings um, and had been rebuffed by multiple institutions. Um, and that sadly is true. You hear that story in repeatedly of LGBTQ collections. One might have heard it, frankly, even of the couple collection, regardless of how preeminent and, and superlative it is. Um, so what's actually here on this slide is correspondence between the Homosexual Law Reform Society and the Progressive League um, about how to respond um, to um, the uh, Wolfenden report, how to best make the case, how many institutions should campaign, how many institutions should seek to give evidence um, to Parliament. So 
while these organizations have their own archives preserved in other institutions, this inter-institutional correspondence, uh, which has survived by sheer chance, is actually unique in Senate House um, and is, is very well <coughs> worthwhile um, examining. Um, I would just excuse the quality of the images because of lockdown. I haven't been able to get in and have proper images taken. They're all my own reference images. But uh, if we could have the next slide. Um, the other thing Craig did was obsessively collect um, flyers, bits of uh, bibliographic information um, that uh, he thought were of interest in terms of uh, censorship. Um, and uh, obscenity legislation. And here we can just see a couple of examples which um, reveal the more problematic um, elements of, of some of what has been preserved in our collections. Um, these uh, pieces of paper were both published by a gentleman called Francis Edwin Murray, um, who uh, was a publisher in London but retired to uh, Ramsgate, uh, where he uh, was a very prolific uh, printer. Um, the, the item on the right, a uh, new volume of paedophile verse, um, it is quite, it is somehow viscerally shocking to see that, um, but it reminds us of a cultural moment when the greatest public expression in print of uh, gay desire, of male male desire, uh, was of male desire for boys. Uh, and Edwin um, Francis Murray was a very prolific publisher and Craig collected his flyers and some of his uh, publications. Um, the item on the left, Broken Interludes, the story of a honeymoon, um, is a flyer for a book which we know was printed by J.M. Stuart Young, um, who uh, printed several novels with paedophile themes. Um, however, no surviving copy of Broken Interludes exists, uh, and this in fact is the best documentary evidence of the existence of this book, um, and it's preserved by chance um, in the Craig archive. Uh, so a good illustration of how LGBTQ uh, material is both liable um, to be lost um, if we don't take action, but also that Craig's optimism uh, about it simply being a case of censorship, that, that that isn't the whole story. If I could have the next slide. Um, Eric Dingwall, again, a largely totally forgotten figure. He was frequently described as the British Kinsey. Um, and in fact, he had the uh, pleasure of giving Kinsey uh, a tour of Soho. Uh, when uh, Kinsey came over to London um, in the 1960s. Um, Dingwall was uh, principally known as a psychic investigator, uh, an investigator of the paranormal, uh, which is why very few photographs of him exist, because he didn't want to be recognised if he walked into a medium's uh, seance room. However, um, all through his life, uh, Dingwall was absolutely fascinated by all uh, all aspects of human sexuality and he regarded paranormal activity as as embedded in libido um, if i could have the next slide the the image on the left is just an example of around 30 scrapbooks that dingwall kept throughout his life these are the most incredible documents um they're you can see on the left that um, the scrapbook is not a, a, a conventional plain scrapbook. It's actually a family Bible um, over which Dingwall pasted um, thousands and thousands of press cuttings, photographs, postcards, bits of paper, flyers, ephemera. Um, and they cover almost, they cover an extremely wide variety of, of human behaviour and human interest. Um, but amongst these scrapbooks, Craig um, Dingwall collected a huge amount um, of press cuttings and other material about LGBTQ lives, but as they popped up in the popular press. So the item on the right there um, is a press report about Lord Montague of Bewley's uh, prosecution um, for um, underage sex with a 14 year old Boy Scout in a chalet on a beach. Um, this case, uh, which Lord Montague to his death absolutely denied, um, was instrumental um, 
in uh, the uh, the eradication, the decriminalization um, of of, uh, of male male sex, uh, a fact of which Lord Montague was very proud. Um, and he was a, a close personal friend of, of Peter Wildblood, whose, whose memoir um, some of us uh, uh, will doubtless know. Um, these are obviously not unique press cuttings, but the agglomeration of them, the bringing of them together um, is unique. And Dingwall's scrapbooks, I would suggest, are the most fantastic uh, queer um, resources in, in, in every sense. Um, if I could have the next slide. Um, some of these cases um, are some of these cases that he preserved are in fact the sort of only um, the only record that these lives have left. Um, the example on the left there um, is of uh, a woman who uh, attempted to marry um, a, a, another woman of the auxiliary territorial service um, just after the Second World War. Um, all of the press coverage, um, without exception, was that this poor young girl had been duped. Uh, but, um, you know, I think that there is a queer life trapped um, in that press cutting that has not been expressed. Um, and again, while this newspaper exists in multiple libraries, the context of it um, filed away in Dingwall's scrapbooks um, does give a great deal of context and a great deal of richness. Um, the item on the left, again, Dingwall was was really very, very interested not only in prosecution for public indecency, that Ian Harvey was a, a government minister um, apprehended in a bush in St James's Park with a Coldstream guard um, and had to uh, resign and um, ironically then spent his life as a, a public relations specialist uh, working for Yardley, the people who make old English lavender soap. Um, but um, Dingwall was also obsessed with collecting information about blackmailers who preyed um, on the people featured in his scrapbooks. Um, and he would write uh, to many of the people featured in these scrapbooks, um, usually letters that were unanswered, um, I have to say. Um, so the last thing I'm going to mention uh, from the Dingwall archive um, is um, the case of Reg Reginald Sanders from 1964. Now, this is, again, an example of how um, queer lives are, are, are preserved accidentally in an archive in ways which are not entirely helpful. Uh, Reginald Sanders died of um, autoerotic asphyxiation in 1964 um, and after his death the police found um, a huge number of photographs in his flat um, of um, Sanders himself uh, naked in simulated hangings uh, surrounded by uh, images that he had found um, erotically exciting uh, with blackboards um, next to his uh, his own body on which he would write uh, very poorly spelled um, uh, descriptions of how he had been found birched, whipped, multiply raped and hanged for his crimes. Um, it certainly appears to be true that Dingwall improperly acquired copies of these photographs from the police force involved. They have become the only surviving instant. They are the only surviving copies of these photographs. They are the only surviving copies of a queer man's life and something that was important to him. But the ethics of how those things have survived in our archive are obviously deeply problematic. Um, and again, it is sheer chance that Dingwall wrote so many letters to police officers that someone was willing um, to collaborate with him. I don't have photographs um, of, of those uh, of those images and I, I probably wouldn't put them up on the PowerPoint if I did have them. Um, the very, very last, I'm over time, the very, very last thing I'm going to mention is that we also have um, the personal archive of a graphologist called Robert Saudek, um, who um, studied 
the uh, the way in which our handwriting d d um, displayed our personality. Um, and Saudek was a, a, a wealthy man who was employed by many large firms to uh, sift uh, job applicants, uh, but he also published on the uh, subject of graphology and was very successful. Um, however, he also was in the habit of going to Bow Street Magistrates Court and asking men uh, prosecuted uh, for uh, public indecency, uh, behavior likely to outrage public morality, and all of the other euphemisms for having sex with another man, um, and would ask them to copy out sections of the Times, which he would then share with his fellow graphologists. Um, the uh, diagnoses that they uh, heaped upon these men, uh, having been told that they had been prosecuted for these crimes, are extraordinary. Um, they are all found guilty of being sociopaths and having murderous tendencies um, and it is a really fascinating if very small insight um, into uh, in, into the attitude um, to lgbtq lives um, but these are fragments but i think the fact that they are fragments makes them uh, all the more compelling um, because people's the, the the history of lgbtq lives in this country is arguably only preserved in fragments um and it certainly uh, it certainly deserves greater study but i'm well over time so i'll be quiet well thank you richard for this really interesting introduction to the archival holdings at Senate House. And now we will move on to what e-resources you can use at Senate House to do your own research into um, LGBTQ history and literature in London. So for this purposes, I will just share my screen with you. So just bear with me for one second. So you should now be able to see the home page of Senate House Library. Um, so, um, to view our full list of e-resources, you will have to go to databases and e-resources onto our homepage here. And on the next page, you have to click on accessing e-resources. And on the top of the page here, you will see a link to the list where we list all our e-resources in one place. Just before we move to this list to show you the resources themselves, um, the access to our e-resources require a membership of Senate House Library. And depending on your type of membership, you may also have different levels of access to the full catalogue of our e-resources. And you can find out more about what you're entitled to access on the bottom of the page here. But let's now turn to the e-resources list itself, which is this list here. So once you've opened the list, you are able to see all the resources that we subscribe to in one place. And to make the browsing of this list a bit easier, because there's quite a lot on here, we have developed some subject categories uh, which you can filter the list by. And to filter the list, you just have to go to all subjects and this will open a drop down menu for you. And if you filter the list by the category LGBTQ plus studies, you will see all the resources that we have available to study LGBTQ plus history and literature at one glance. So we will show you two resources from this list and I will start out with the Archives of Sexuality and Gender. So the Archives of Sexuality and Gender brings together digitized content from hundreds of different institutions worldwide, including major international ac activist organizations and also smaller local grassroots groups too. It offers many different types of documents that you can have a look into, including the archives of LGBTQ rights organisations and groups, as well as newspapers and newsletters and magazines. And there's also medical research records, policy statements and private correspondence in, in here. So a lot of wealth of material that you can access. Um, you can find out further information about the different digital collections within this resource by going to the menu under the main search box and by clicking on collections. A lot of the material in this resource is um, originally from North America, but there's also two specific collections in here available to research British LGBTQ plus history. The first is gay activism in Britain from 19, 
58. And this offers digitized content from the whole Carpenter archives held at the London School of Economics. And I saw that some of you already asked about this in the chat. So there's some digital material, if not all material from this archive available here. And the second collection that is of interest to researching LGBTQ history is Sexual Politics in Britain further down here. And this documents the emergence of Britain's women's liberation and gay rights movement in the 1970s. And the collection includes a really significant uh, list of LGBTQ plus publications, and they're all listed at the bottom here on the publication titles. And another thing that you can do with this collection is you can search within this collection with this search box here, or you can also have a browse through all the documents in the collection by clicking on this button here to view all the documents that are contained within here. Alternatively, what you can also do is search across the whole collection with a keyword search, and so that will give you access to all the materials across the whole resource. And next to the search box here, you can also see that there is an option to do an advanced search. And this is a function to help you narrow down your search results and to make them more precise. And what I'll do now is demonstrate to you how you can use an advanced search for locating materials on London LGBTQ history. So the advanced search function, once it loads, will, as you see here, will allow you to uh, combine different search terms with each other. And it also allows you to search across different fields that describe the items that are within this database. So when you open this drop down menu, you will see that you have several options to search across different types of fields. And for the purposes of the search we're trying to do, I will narrow the uh, selection down to place of publication. And in the search box, I will add the term London. So this gives us only um, items that are published in London. And um, to do a more precise search, what I'll do is I'll combine the first search with the keyword lesbian and to search across documents with the term um, that were published in London. And what I've also done here is I've put the um, term into quotation marks and that makes the search only return results where the exact phrase is present rather than uh, variations of the phrase. Another useful function of the advanced search is that you can limit your um, results by publication date with this section here. And this is really particularly useful if you're, for example, looking into one decade of history or just a single year. And what I'll do for our purposes is just limit our date range to 1960 or to between 1960 and 1970. OK, and if we perform a search with these parameters, the search will return us about 29 results. So that gives you a quite nice little sample overview over what materials are held within the database. So let's have a close look at one of the entries. The first result here this is an issue of Arena Free. And Arena Free was the first openly lesbian British publication. And if we scroll down, to, or, or the first openly lesbian magazine, I should say, there probably were other publications before that. So, um, but if we scroll down to the bottom here, once the image loads, if it does, Taking a bit. Again. This should be loading an image, but it's not doing it right now. <laughs> That's um, my apologies for this. Um, this worked fine about an hour ago. Um, but what you would have seen here is the title page of the issue in question and um, you'll just have to believe me when I say this but at the bottom of the title page you would have been able to see that uh, Arena Free was published by a person called Esme Langley from an address uh, 98 Belsize Lane London NW3 and um, I did a bit of a search on Esme Langley and it turns out that she was also a founding member of the English Minorities Research Group and this was the first organisation to openly advocate for the interests of lesbians in the UK. And the reports of the group often features in, featured in Arena Free as well, alongside other polemical writings, case studies and creative writing. 
Um, so another thing I just wanted to show you, you can also prefer, perform further searches when you are within a document such as this. You can search within an article of an issue, within a whole issue, or you can also search within the whole publication that is across all the issues of Arena 3 that are digitized on this database. And um, what I'm going to try to do now is do a search for uh, the word meeting. So we can see if we can find out more about different social gatherings that the lesbian community had within, Lon within London. And I'm also going to search across the whole publication so we get a few more results. And when we perform the search, we get a result of 22 items. And if you, for example, had a look at the second entry here, that is the issue of Arena Free from 1967, volume 4, issue 4. One of the really useful things that this database does, it gives you the locations of the different search term hits in the left hand side um, menu here. So basically, these are all the page numbers where the search term meeting appears within this issue. And if we navigate to page 29, I can only hope that it loads the image now. If it doesn't, you will just have to believe me again that it's there. It's not loading. I, I do apologize for this glitch, but um, on page 29, if you do do this search yourself, you will find that there are two different meetings that were advertised within Arena Free uh, that took place in London in 1967. And what this does is it gives us a nice initial insight into uh, meeting places and networks that the lesbian community was able to establish through their, were able to establish through their publications in the mid 20th century. And it can be a nice prompter for you to do further research. Um, so hopefully this has given you some idea uh, or some inspiration to explore the resource source for it for yourself. And I hope for that in your case, the images do work. <laughs> um, but I'll now hand over to Leila so she can um, demonstrate to you another resource from the list that we just saw. Thanks, Agala. If you just bear with me a moment, we're swapping around sharing screens. So I'm just going to share mine now. And nearly there. Hopefully you can see this um, homepage here, which is to another resource called the LGBT Magazine Archive. Um, this contains full text digital scans of 26 LGBTQ magazines. There's quite a lot of North American content on here, including the James White Review and Transgender Tapestry. But there are also 12 publications on here originating from the UK, most of which from London, including Gay News, Gay Times, Diva, and the publications from the Campaign for Homosexual Equality. So the magazines span about 60 years of coverage, beginning from 1954 and going up to about a year ago. Um, and you can choose to either read a particular magazine or you can um, search an article or you can search keywords across the entirety of the content. So I'm going to show you just two ways today of, how, of searching this. Um, the, the resource is published by a group called ProQuest and they we subscribe to a number of their resources. They all look very similar. They all look like this. <laughs> so what you get, you get a basic search screen underneath which you get some very basic information about the content of the resource. And then you also get a few little options at the top in a toolbar there. So let's begin by looking at searching just one particular magazine. You may just want to look at one magazine. To do that, just go to the list of publications at the top and click on that link there. This will take us through to an alphabetical list of the 26 publications. And as you can see from the top one, you've got the advocate from Los Angeles there. It will tell you briefly the date range available on the site. So from this one, you can look from 1967 to 2015 and it tells you where it's published. And again, you can look down the list. There's AIDS Weekly Atlanta. There's Arcade from Arcade from Paris. There's Broadsheet, which was from Shea in Manchester, Diva um, in London. And we're going to look today at Gay Times, which is a London magazine, which originally appeared in print in 1975 but is available here online, as you can see, from 1984. So to access the particular publication, you just click on the title, which is a live link, and it will take us through to the full text of that particular magazine. Now, once you're in the magazine's homepage, you have two ways of searching it. 
you can if you want just look at one particular issue and you can see here you've got this option choose an issue to view it will always default to the most recent one available but you can use these little drop down menus to play around with these and maybe decide for instance to look at something from 1984 and to maybe let's look at the particular issue from september that year and then we can just click view issue and we will get the details of that particular issue. And the way it's presented here, you get all the different parts of the magazine from the cover, the advertisements, and then all the different features within it listed separately. So you've got live links to all the different aspects of it, which really just looking at that gives you a sense of 1980s life in some ways, life on the dole, the struggle against censorship. There's lots of advertisements. Um, the Gay Fringe in Edinburgh, so you get cultural events as well. But we can just to show you what it looks like. We can just have a look at the cover. So we'll click on that link there. Hopefully we'll get the image up this time. This is the perils of doing live searching from your kitchen. There we go. This is the front cover to this particular issue of um, Gay Times, which has got the musician Tom Robinson on there but also a hint to what's inside. There's information there, latest news on particular police raids, which Sarah touched on in her talk when she spoke about the Operation Tiger at Gaze the Word bookshop, which was exactly this year, 1984. So that's how you access a particular sort of issue. However, you may wish to um, have a look across the whole content of Gay Times. You may wish to see what Gay Times reported on a particular theme, for instance, and you can do that. So there's this option here above the issues just saying search within this publication. And we're going to search the Black Lesbian and Gay Centre here. And again, like Argalus said, I'm using quotation marks to ensure I'm searching as a phrase. And we'll just search that there. And again, we're searching across Gay Times for Black Lesbian and Gay Centre. There are 48 results across the content mentioning that centre. And just for easy easiness, we can just look at the first one here, which is from 1992. And what's nice about this resource is that you can click on it and it zooms in. And that's quite nice when you're reading something online, certainly to see things clearly. It will also highlight for you in yellow the parts where your keywords have shown up. So you can see in the right corner there, it's Britain to get Europe's first black lesbian and gay centre, which was in Peckham. And there's a little bit of information there. It's actually a call out to help with the fundraising for this. And it gives you the, in, the introduction there to this, um, where the premises they've got. And if you've got any fundraising ideas, there's a VM box that you can contact there with your ideas. Now, few, throughout this session, both Argola and Richard have mentioned the idea of looking for networks and also the idea of fragmented histories. And I think what these magazines are really amazing for is you start doing a search like that and then you get a whole page which gives you even more context to the times. And on this page, for instance, not only do you have a couple of adverts, um, including something here, the St Mary's Hospital Cottaging and Cruising Project, which was doing a call out for people to be interviewed for that, but you get this little advert for the American poet Essex Hempel, who was on a tour, a speaking tour of the UK. He's described here as the Western world's most prominent voice in black gay literature. And he was touring with, tour, touring with a new collection, Brother to Brother. And um, it shows you where he was invited to speak. And that can give you, again, little snapshot of all the networks and spaces where the gay community could maybe meet and speak. And amongst them, you'll see there's the Black Resource Centre in Manchester. There's lots of community colleges and students' unions. But there's also something here, Centre Prize in Hackney, which was a community bookshop, creche, cafe and publishing centre, which works um, with, with the Hackney community. It was the only bookshop in Hackney at the time, and they'd invited Essex Hempel to speak there. So you get this little sense of all the networks and these little snippets here can provide really useful research leads. The other thing that takes up a lot of the page here is um, about the um, AIDS memorial quilt uh, in the US. This was started to memorialise people who died from AIDS related illnesses and the UK project is being launched here. And again, they're doing a call out here to for asking for people for 
quilts to donate to the project and they're showing a picture here of one of the quilts and for those of you who've seen the film Pride you'll recognize the name Mark Ashton. Mark Ashton was an, a gay and lesbian and rights activist and a communist who also who have also volunteered at Gays the World Bookshop and Houseman's Bookshop and he also died of an AIDS related illness very young there and there's a his, he's being memorialised there on this quilt. And it's a really nice introduction to some of the context, the material, the spaces and the places and the launching of community centres for the, for the lesbian and gay community in the early 80s. What's also very nice about this resource is that you can download the pages as PDFs and save them. You can email them to yourself or if you wish, you can print them so you can keep them for further reference. Now, the other thing you can do, you may want to search the content of the whole of this site. You may want to look across all the magazines that are on here and you can do that. Again, just go back to the home page by clicking on basic search. And this here you can search your own key terms if you wish. And so you could search, for instance, again, the phrase pretty police, which was the name given by the gay community to undercover policemen who uh, sought out to entrap gay men. And there's 75 results across the whole site. So you can see we've got results from the pink paper there. We've got results from a campaign newsletter from Shay. We've got the Gay Times here as well. And we can just have a look at one of these. So just by searching across the entire content, you can get articles and again it highlights where your keywords are and gives you the full page so you can also see again some really interesting adverts there there was a party there in Talbot in Blackpool at the Flamingo Club being advertised um, Chris Smith who became an MP is there and also it, it, linking again into um, Sarah's talk the gate the pretty police article here is mentioning uh, an MP called um, Sorry, uh, let me find his name. It's um, Keith Hampson, who was uh, arrested at the Gay Theatre in Soho. And following his arrest, he was actually acquitted. And his arrest led to some changes in the law about the use of pretty police and restrictions in their usage. And it's mentioned here in context with um, the gay community feels itself under attack by what is happening in London. Entrapment, the raid on Gays the Word Bookshop and the raids on gay clubs and pubs in London. So it shows here that almost 20 years after the partial decriminalisation of, of homosexuality, that the gay community is pulling together to fight the continued state harassment from the police and other, other factors of the state there. So this is a really nice resource for looking at cultural events and looking at political events and looking at the way the networks from within the community pulled together and supported each other. I'm now just going to share with you one more slide. We've just finished there the talks for today. And before we go on to the Q&A, which will happen in a moment, just want to highlight another couple of resources to you. Um, this links to the Queer Between the Covers um, exhibition season, which took place at Senate House Library a couple of years ago and which Sarah has already mentioned. The website for this exhibition is still live and we'll post it in the chat in a moment. And also it's in the resource list we're going to share with you. But on there we have an online bookshelf. During the exhibition, we asked visitors to post on their books that they read, which most spoke to them um, when about their queer identity and we've created a little bookshelf there and if you still if you'd like to add to that bookshelf you still can do or you can just look on there to see which books other people chose and it's a really nice resource looking at books that have meant something to people at various stages in their lives and also linked to the exhibition in May this year um, the library is publishing with the University of London Press a book called Queer Between the Covers, which contains six chapters showing various aspects of LGBTQ publishing history, including ch chapters on John Venus, Derek Jarman, The Hazard Press, Telony, Valerie Taylor, and also Gaze the Word Operation Tiger. So that's due out as an open access, a free open access ebook in May this year, and we'll be promoting it a little more when that's available. So that brings us to the end of the, um, the main part of our session. These are our contact details. We hope that you'll stay for the next 10 minutes or so when we open up to Q&A, but we do understand that some of you may need to leave now. Before you go, um, just to say we will be sharing the recording of this session 
um, we'll be sharing the resource list and also a feedback form, which it really helps us if you have time to fill out. And we're sharing that via email after the session. So thank you for coming. And for those of you who can stay and ask questions and join us for that part, you can either raise your hand by using the hands up icon via Teams or you can post your questions in the chat. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and then you'll be able to see us all again, all four of us. So you can start to ask uh, questions. Let me just go in and stop sharing. Bear with me. <laughs> There we go. Hopefully we'll all emerge on there now. So while we're waiting to see if there's any questions, I did notice there was one in the chat, um, which is for Richard, I think. It was a question about uh, Craig and whether he was influenced by Freudian theory. I think I sneakily answered that, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, the, essentially the answer is no. Um, but, um, his uh, his sexological theory didn't really get past Kraft Ebbing and uh, uh, Edward Carpenter. Um, he appears to have owned no Freud, although it's impossible to know for sure what Craig owned um, because of the uh, sale of most of his uh, his library for the benefit of Camden Council. Um, but uh, he never refers to Freud um, in any of his publications. Um, uh, but he, he was heavily influenced by uh, Carpenter. Uh, he was a personal friend of Edward Carpenter, um, uh, who of course died in 1929, but, but Craig was a, 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 a close personal friend of his. And um, he was the librarian of the British Sexological Society, which Carpenter had founded. Um, which uh, effectively operated as a as a uh, a gay rights organisation um, within the UK um, for some time. Craig still described himself as the librarian of the BSS even in the 1960s, even though the Sexological Society had not met for four decades. Um, and of course, actually, having mentioned Carpenter, I should just uh, add. Uh, just for laughs, uh, that Dr. Jonathan Cutbill was uh, the literary executor of Edward Carpenter, incredibly. Um, so um, amongst the, uh, you know, impossibly rich holdings which have come to us from Dr. Jonathan Cutbill um, is uh, also um, a, a considerable quantity um, of archival material uh, letters from Carpenter, uh, some of which I would say appear, but right now some of which appear not to have been published and and described um, before, um, which uh, which is in itself, let alone the thirty thousand books, which is in itself very exciting. Do we have any other questions? Um, as we said, we have left our email addresses and we're very happy for people to ask us anything via email as well afterwards individually or as a group. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us about this session or any other resources at Senate House that library that we can we can assist you with both online and in print, particularly during these very strange times. We can sort of explain some of our processes for accessing things if that if that's helpful as well. No. I don't think we have any questions there. OK, well, in that case, I think we'll just say thank you very much for attending and for listening and for coming along today. And we wish you all the best with your own research. And as I say, please don't hesitate to get in touch with any of us at any point. We'll be very happy to speak with you about this subject or any others about Senate House Library too. So thank you very much. <laughs>